So I, I now have the pleasure of getting to interview you guys um, and talk to both of you a little bit about your histories and your interests in terms of what's happening in the prop tech space right now. Um, and we thought maybe it would be interesting for people who don't know to start off with just a quick kind of, how did you guys get into this world? Like what's your background and your history? Uh, so, um uh, I guess it's sort of, for me, it's a bit of a circular route. So I moved to the U.S. Um, for, uh, for business school and actually I spent a summer um, working, uh, working at a venture capital firm. And, um, uh, and they kind of said, Pete, find us stuff to invest in. And I was the summer intern, which is like absolutely the lowest level job in any, <laughs> probably any company, but certainly any venture capital firm. Um, <coughs> And uh, as it turned out, I, like, this was 2004, and they said, and they said, look at this real estate industry. There must be some stuff there. Um, and I and I looked around for a while, and I, I essentially couldn't find anything, in, literally anything interesting. Um, so I said, well, what company would I invest in? And that um, essentially became um, truly. I wrote, essentially wrote the business plan for truly built off a thesis. I said, well, I should just do this. Um, so I so I did that. So I basically. <laughs> um, kind of worked on it during my second year at, um, at business school, launched it, and then did that for 10 years. And then, and it was a little, at the time, I was kind of more interested in sort of solving the problems than necessarily kind of connecting capital and, and people and problems. But kind of 10 years after that, I said, well, maybe I'll go back to that kind of investing <laughs> thing, um, which was quite interesting. And then, um, and teamed up with a couple of uh, uh, friends and people I hugely respected to, to get NFX going, which has been going for about, two to three years. Awesome. And I had, um, I had worked in the Valley at uh, E-Trade and Yahoo prior to joining Pete at Trulia, so probably eight years or so uh, working on consumer internet. Had gotten a little taste of, of real estate at Yahoo, where I was responsible for Yahoo Real Estate before the launch of Trulia and Zillow. Uh, eventually was connected to Pete and joined Trulia as a COO about five years into Trulia's history and stayed another six or seven years from private to public to acquisition by Zillow. When Zillow bought us, Pete decided it was time to move on, and I, uh, I carried the mantle forward for a couple of years. Uh, and then post that experience, I was really thinking about what I wanted to do next. Uh, spent some time as an EIR at a couple of venture capital firms. Uh, figured meeting entrepreneurs and drinking LaCroix was kind of the thing for me for the next <laughs> leg of the journey. Uh, <laughs> lined up with Sapphire Ventures and, and joined them last year. Uh, so you Where's your Patagonia? I know. I, I need it. I'm <laughs> uh, you guys have now been basically in every seat that you could have been, you, um, Pete in particular, uh, around funding, right? So you've raised venture capital, you've taken a company public, you've then gone through an acquisition, and now you're an investor yourself. So do you want, can you talk us just through a little bit about those different steps in the chain and stuff you learned, reflections you have? Um, yeah, I, I mean, there's like, uh, it all looks kind of good on the outside, but kind of behind <laughs> the scenes, like every entrepreneur, there's a thousand no's or at least a kind of like 50 plus no's for every one yes. So, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's really hard. I th you know, I think just sort of quickly on just my experiences, like I found that kind of like the big mistakes I made early on is a, like um, when we were getting Trulia going and trying to get seed funding, um, was that we um, we created the back end, which was actually really sort of quite hard to do, and then we had the ugly front end, and everyone said no, and then um, and then we just slapped on this front end, which we thought was the easy thing, um, and everyone said yes, this looks amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's sort of amazing how kind of like what you think is hard about a business um, is often different what investors need to see, and what they need to see was like we we're confident we could see that you could someone could figure out the technical aspect. We're just not sure we could build a, cons a great consumer experience. Um, and so just to be very empathetic around kind of what, um, what investors are looking for and the proof points they want to succeed. Yeah, may maybe related to that, I'll, I'll tell a story. So, uh, so I joined Truly in the beginning of 2011. <coughs> this was post Series C. And I remember the press release when I joined was about Trulia building an IPO-ready management team. I was like, whew. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds awesome. And then three months later, we were going out to raise a growth round, 
and met with, I mean, must have met with two dozen of the fanciest investors around and didn't get a taker on the growth round. And I was like, what the heck just happened? I joined this company to be part of the IPO ready team and <laughs> investors, you know, didn't love the space. There weren't, you know, this was before people called it prop tech and no one's built a big company in real estate tech and the churn was too high and the competitive situation was too crazy. Um, we ended up not raising that round. We raised, raised some venture debt and two years later uh, had a successful IPO. So. Uh, I, I remind myself of that now sitting in the investor seat of like, investors don't always have it right. Uh, often there's a lot more nuance to the story than can be seen from the outside. But um, that, was a, that was a sobering moment for me in the yeah. beginning. Yeah. I think, I mean, one th specific to this, this audience, this conversation, the, the environment has changed kind of radically over the last decade. So, I mean, it's radical in terms of both the innovation, but also the capital inflows. And I think it's, you know, what, what we've seen today over the last decade is like a number of very successful companies, you know, multi-billion dollar, certainly billion dollar. I think if in real estate, there's been, I, I think, almost more billion dollar companies than any other category created in the last decade or so, which is sort of staggering when you think about it. And that's, um, there's not been a hundred billion dollar company, but there has been like multiple billion dollar companies, which is certainly very attractive. I think you've seen entrepreneurs that said, well, you know, this sort of light touch, social mobile communication, media type businesses of like, that's done. That's so competitive, it's almost impossible. They're going into these more regulated, more complex, you've got more experienced entrepreneurs going after that. And then you've just seen this sort of influx of capital that's come in, which has come over the last decade, which is creating business model innovation, which is um, kind of aiding that open door would just never be possible in, you know, 10 years ago, it's certainly because there was sort of so much scar tissue from the financial class, but the that as you know, the sort of debt funding that to, to, you know, you're you're a tech guy that wants to raise it. They just could not compute, you know, ten years ago. But now it's now that has kind of fueled a whole bunch of additional innovation, which is kind of why we're here, yeah. uh, I guess. So it's you know mentioning Eric <coughs> and Open Door. One thing that I've noticed recently is that we're developing this little like a truly a mafia of um, founders in the space. You know, a, a notable number of founders in the space actually had exposure to Trulia in their earlier careers. Obviously, Eric, Sean, um, Sean Black, uh, Sean and Jamie. Yeah. Um, from Knock. Yeah. Yeah. From yeah. Knock. Uh -huh. Andrew from Lyric. Um, it, Jonathan McNulty at House. Yeah. Yeah. What is it that you think, you know, there is no other, if we don't, there isn't an equivalent group of people who worked at Zillow, for instance. Like, what do you think it was that was happening at Trulia that helped mm -hmm. to foment this? Uh, I think it's a couple of things. I think so. One is, you know, one is you often see that there are certain companies that create more entrepreneurial pockets than others. So, one was that we, um, you know, organizationally, it was certainly more autonomous and more decentralized than you typically see, um, where there were kind of units. We deliberately kind of like distributed innovation to the edges of the organization um, and pushed creativity to the edges. So it wasn't a sort of tops down. It's my idea. Obviously, I had the best ideas, but like... Um, <laughs> just kidding, seriously. Um, but like pushing innovation to the edges and you'd encourage people to like experiment, come up with ideas, execute those ideas. So pushing innovation to the edges was critical. And it was a, um, you know, unlike, you know, you meet the sort of, you know, average PM at Google, they're like, they've, they've, they can build amazing products, but they don't know how to drive distribution. Just, you know, being in a sort of relatively lightly funded company, we had to think about growth and distribution from the outset, which is just sort of fundamental to, to startup success. So. And then I think the sort of hiring bar, I think we just created a, um, a kind of hiring bar that, that created. And may maybe last year, I think there's a little, I sort of think of it as, it's not identical, but with sort of PayPal, there was sort of like um, unfinished business, you know, getting acquired by your closest competitor makes you actually more hungry um, than it is makes you lazy. Um, and so I think there's a lot of people who are like, okay, like this was, this was good, now I'm going to like, go and do something else and, and use what I've learned in, in another context. Is that, do you have anything else, Paul? Uh, no, I agree. I mean, I, I think culture is, I guess my, my takeaway just sort of for the general audience is just, uh, 
I think culture is, is, is everything in startups. And I think, um, I think credit to you and, and Sami from the early days of just embedding culture and that hiring bar from day one. I joined, I think there were probably 100 or so people there. And it was just an amazing group of talent top to bottom. And I think like as founders, I think those first 20, 50, 100 people that you hire matter so much. Like you really cannot change culture past or in a meaningful way past those first 50 or 100 hires. And I just feel like, uh, you, you know, truly I had this amazing roster of smart, entrepreneurial, um, but really collaborative and sort of positive energy. And it was just like, it was just palpable when you walk in the office. And I think that's a lot of what came from it as well. So you now both are, you know, actively investing and you guys have very um, complementary <laughs> investment focuses, right? NFX is focused earlier, um, primarily C to A, mm -hmm. um, and Sapphire is focused more on growth. So, you know, you can give money to the next you in the round after someone like you was hired, Paul. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> um, the answer to that is yes. Yeah. Uh, what, what is it that you're seeing that you're really interested in in the space right now? Given your backgrounds in prop tech, I'm sure you guys both see a lot of stuff. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll go first on a couple. I think um, one of them is, is just there's still so much happening in residential real estate, right? If you think about the kind of evolution of residential real estate and technology, there was kind of first generation sites like Realtor.com that sort of got a little bit far, and those, that was the big gorilla that we were then trying to topple uh, at Truly and Zillow. And then you look at the last 10 years and the progress that Truly, a Zillow, Redfin, as now pu all sort of public companies found a success. I mean, that really, to me, was kind of automating the front end of the process, making it easier for consumers to find listings and consumers to find agents. The transaction itself is like barely touched. Uh, and so the process of, uh, you know, f of financing, uh, the process of closing and taking title, uh, the, you know, process of moving in and home insurance. So I kind of feel like a lot of these ancillaries uh, are one big theme area that I think is, is really, really exciting and there's just a lot to do there. And to me, that's a, that's a 10x bigger opportunity than the, the opportunity that Truly and Zillow and, and others sort of got so far. And then the other thing I'll mention is just housing affordability. I mean, you heard about it with uh, Assembly Member Chu, and I think just across the board, uh, there's just crazy housing inequality across the country. And so a lot of models uh, that are really trying to make it easier for people to afford their first home, for people who have one home to then get it, move to a second home and buy and sell in conjunction, I think all of those models to me are fascinating. And it's about time as well. So those are, those are two themes that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've got more as well. well. Well, I think we probably have sort of three themes that we're focused on. So one is just the similar, the, the transaction, but I probably broaden it to be on just the residential real estate transaction. It's also other transactions in the industry. So that could be um, commercial, it could be retail, it could be rental. It's like, I still think, that, you know, it's the transaction is the, is the where the opportunity is and it's just so much harder and it's not going to be a one size fits all. You know, I think what Open Door, the value proposition for Open Door is sort of specific for one type of segment, and you're going to see this stratification of segments. Similarly, in the other in the other markets as well. So it's solving the transaction. Two is the, I call it broadly alt living, which may sort of tie into affordability, but it's it's again you're just seeing. You know, I I know when I first rented in San Francisco, it's like, you know, you're sort of a backward landlord and a kind of funny sort of property manager, and the whole thing was sort of incredibly backward. Um, <laughs> and then that's the same for most of the US. And so you see all these companies evolving evolving right now, whether that's co-living or whether that's sort of more professional kind of like uh, alternative living. I think that the question that we ask ourselves within that is like, where's the tech and where's the margin? And I think that's, you know, if there's great tech, great margin and great network effects, then it's interesting. And then the last one is around sort of spend around the home. So this is um, you know, it can be from sort of innovative uses of AI and computer vision to solve construction or improve construction. I mean, you, you think about the expenditures. You, if, you, if you want to get a small renovation done in your house, it's incredibly expensive. Um, just you look around and see the cranes in the city, a trillion, trillion, of do trillion dollars is spent on construction. And so that's 
that's yet to be touched by technology and starting to see some interesting businesses in that area as well. Are there specific trends around, you know, commercial? So, for instance, construction versus um, small home renovations that you guys are interested in? Well, I'll tell you one thing that we're perhaps challenging with is like, uh, uh, is like trying to navigate CoStar, quite honestly. Yeah. It's like there's a lot of like, you know, there's a sort of like elephant in the room, which is highly litigious and... Uh, and it's like, you know, it's make, and that's sort of a, you know, that's fascinating to kind of figure out like that, you know, $20 billion company is, I think it's probably the largest, uh, the most valuable. I, I can see Rich Boyle laughing in the corner. <laughs> 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 but, that, <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, in that specific category, it's like, you know, that, you know, I think you do have to, um, I think that's you know commercial specifically. Like, how do you how do you navigate um, uh, that company? Um, and that you know that's both a challenge and an opportunity for for startups because that that they do have a kind of the, the tentacles in many parts of that industry. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think commercial is a huge space. Um, we're investors in Rianomy. Michael was on the stage earlier. Um, and I think we are looking for additional plays in, in commercial. I think it is a challenge. Uh, we have had a challenge with um, adoption. So, uh, you know, a lot of the commercial real estate industry has not been the fastest space to adopt technology. So even if you build something amazing, that's step one. Step two is to actually drive the distribution and adoption. I think that's the, we're looking for that sort of one-two punch in, in big spaces like commercial. Awesome. Let's talk a little bit about exits. Um, you know, we're, I would say, as an industry moving closer to the point where we're going to start to have IPO activity. Obviously, we had a big IPO, you know, activity <laughs> uh, uh, earlier this fall. Um, I'm not sure quite what to call that. Um, but what, what do you guys think is going to happen in this space overall? Because one thing I observed with WeWork it, that I feel like we didn't talk enough about because of some of the governance issues that were a distraction is um, prop tech is a unique space where sometimes there's both real asset exposure and growth company exposure. Um, how do you think this is going to play for the space overall in terms of IPO? Yeah, I would, I mean, I would jump in uh, maybe first on just uh, expand on what Pete said earlier, which is I think the more companies have structural high margins and technology at the core and network effects and all those good things, the better they are, the, the more highly valued they are by public market investors, right? You sort of like go through this interesting arc where early stage investing, you're sort of just betting on the dream and the team and the promise. Growth stage investing, you're kind of investing on future growth, you're willing to be unprofitable in support of future growth, and then by the time companies get public, generally, IPO, you know, public market investors are looking for some sort of path to profitability. And so it's interesting to see, like Pete, you mentioned CoStar. So CoStar has a $20 billion market cap and is trading at something like 15 times revenue. Uh, we were investors in DocuSign, which is, I think, $12 billion market cap on less than a billion in revenue. So like at one edge of the extreme, you have companies that are essentially prop tech companies, software businesses that kind of serve the 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 real estate ecosystem that are trading at super high multiples at the opposite extreme you have like traditional brokerages um cbre or jll or remax or realogy as public companies that are trading like less than one times revenue and then kind of somewhere in between you have businesses like redfin it's interesting actually zillow was trading at a um you know, a $10 billion market cap for a billion dollars in pure kind of software internet revenue. And then since they've launched iBuyer, the revenue is actually up to a billion and a half and the market cap is down to like seven billion. So somehow the market is like penalizing the, the, the iBuyer business. So that's a long-winded way of basically saying, I, I think the market is just kind of showing these, this segmentation or separation of uh, businesses that they uh, that public market investors love, which is you know high margin, mostly tech, network effects, uh, you know increasing defensibility, and then at least for now seems to be punishing the kind of lower margin, more asset intensive models. Mm -hmm. I think there's um, the other, the other the other component is that you know public market investors and Wall Street loves predictability. 
They love, they love predictability to know that, okay, this month, this is, you know, this is the march. And so CoStar, you know, as a company does extremely well. Whereas within, um, you know, the sort of traditional brokerage businesses, they are highly seasonal and highly cyclical. Um, and, uh, you know, you could, you sort of, you could argue that something like Open Door is like even more um, cyclical um, uh, than a sort of traditional brokerage because they're taking some element of risk. And so I think it will be, um, it will be challenging um, to like, you know, what is, the, you know, as you see these kind of, many of these companies that have big balance sheet, they're taking debt, they're taking some degree of kind of housing market exposure, um, how they will kind of navigate the public markets. And so, I mean, that's, you know, so there, there is kind of, there's going to be a challenging messaging story. That said, you look at, you know, if you look down the sort of, if you ever go onto this thing called retailroadshow.com, you can see all these kind of companies and there's, you know, typically a few, you know, one or two famous names. And then there's half a dozen biotech companies you've never heard of and half a dozen REITs you've never heard of um, that you, you know, that are, that are sort of bringing in this, this capital. And so there is a significant appetite, um, but just at very different multiples in the public markets for these, these sort of assets. Yeah, we, we had an interesting discussion on the phone about, about Open Door. <laughs> Um, and uh, Pete, you, you were expressing some skepticism about the way you think that the public markets might receive them, and Paul, you were expressing some enthusiasm. I'm curious if you'll <laughs> bring that to the stage. <laughs> uh, I mean, like, I think it's, it's um, uh, I think, you know, I think Eric said it on the stage earlier, it's like Amazon had similar degrees of skepticism uh, for, you know, for many years. You look at that, you know, I think you go back into the sort of press back in 2002 um, or, or you know, or even earlier, it's like, you know, dot bomb, you know, Amazon dot bomb. I mean, it was the narrative that this is like, what are they doing? It's a tech company that's building warehouses. Mm -hmm. What on earth are they doing? And like, and, you know, all the sort of investor money went over to eBay. Um, obviously, kind of like, you know, hindsight um, is 2020, like, you know, Amazon did the right thing by inc being incredibly customer centric, even if they've been like, you know, negative margin or certainly zero margin for a while. So, though, uh, as you pointed out, AWS is a core part of what is allowing Amazon to perform yep. today. And it may be, you know, and there may be a sort of profit machine in there. There may not be, but I think, I think investors um, uh, will be very skeptical. And, and I think there's, um, you know, I think they will be skeptical because, and I think it's extremely hard to sort of, you know, I remember sitting in analyst meetings and kind of saying, well, we're, you know, trying to think through um, where the model is going to be in the next one to two years. Like, if you're Eric, like, good luck with that, you know, <laughs> trying to figure <laughs> out, like, what's your revenue going to be in one to two years? Um, you know, he's a brilliant guy, but and it's a, I think it's a great business, but I think it's just like, you know, it's, it's really hard to give some degree of guidance to, to public market investors. Yeah, and I think I was more just mentioning that, um, uh, as I said earlier, just iBuyer generally, Zillow added $500 million in iBuyer revenue and lost $3 billion in market cap for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so that calculation to me seems off, uh, and I think that's an overreaction, and I do think over time... Um, uh, someone mentioned this morning, just the, uh, I think Eric actually talked about kind of like employee rotation and even investor rotation, yeah. like you have to believe in what the future is. And I think, uh, I, I think the iBuyer model will continue to scale. I think there are certain questions about how profitable, how meaningfully profitable it would be long term, but I kind of feel like there's no doubt that something that has that much consumer adoption and growth um, will, will be valuable businesses. Great. Should we open it up to questions from the audience now? Anybody? People are ready for okay. drink. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Uh oh. Where's the love? <laughs> you know, I hear a lot. Like a lot of times, people say like the buy side is figured out, right? You know, do you think there's ever going to be another portal? You know, another truly a Zillow? I mean, is that is that kind of donezo? Do you think, or is there more room for that, or? Um, have they just been that dom dominant that, that it's, you won't see anything else new? Uh, so in residential real estate, I, I think it's, you know, looking more so internationally, 
um, where the actually US was quite late to kind of adopt sort of the tradition, you know, the sort of like high high quality professional online real estate portal. It wasn't really until um, I would say kind of the you know 2005, six, seven that kind of happened that 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 it was adopted. You look back in in um, other markets and like that they started earlier and they've maintained their market share, if not grown their market share. And so I think just the infrequent nature of the transaction, the network effect of that marketplace, I think once it's established, unless you're asleep at the wheel, um, I, I think it's it's very hard to kind of to do that again. Unless there's a new, you know, unless there's a meaningful innovation, you know, from an inter from a platform perspective, whether, you know, the next mobile, um, but it, it feels that the management teams on the uh, incumbents are so sophisticated that they'll figure out the, that new platform. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I feel like the, the core search experience to me is Dunzo in the U.S. Unless unless something significant changes, I think where you'll see where you are seeing innovation is kind of how consumers and agents interact, uh, smart access to homes, so you can kind of like see a home whenever you want to see it. Little stuff around the edges, but um, I wouldn't expect you know explosive innovation. Can I jump in and say one thing here? I, I do think that regulation around the data is also going to impact that space potentially and that just this past weekend we had NAR pass this coming soon um, requiring all listings to go onto the MLS within 24 hours of being marketed in anywhere else because I think there was a push by a number of players in the space, most significantly Compass, to create almost to recreate a walled garden, and the recreation of a walled garden would impact the the mm -hmm. front end aggregator sites. So, and I expect you could see the DOJ then get involved in that as well. So, outside forces may end up impacting some of these questions as well. So you guys are both in venture firms where you're relatively the prop tech people, and there's a bunch of people that don't focus at all on real estate tech and their and their generalist firms, I'm or generalist partners. I'm curious if you find yourself being the cheerleader or the evangelist for all things prop tech, and you're kind of pulling along some sort of, you know, reticent other folks who would just rather do consumer internet or enterprise, or or whether uh, you're actually because you know so much about the category, you're the relative skeptic about various things, and in fact, the lack of industry expertise that the generalist partners have uh, starts to introduce tension there. I, I wonder if you could just comment about the intra firm dynamics. I'll go. Um, yeah, so I, uh, for sure, I am the prop tech cheerleader inside the firm. I mean, I think there's just so much opportunity in the space in, in all of these different areas that we described. Um, but uh, certainly in, in our firm where there's seven U.S. partners, uh, you know, we make decisions as a partnership. And so there is a process of sort of bringing your partners along. Um, I will say a lot of our firm heritage really is, a, is software businesses, uh, sort of high margin software at the core with the idea being like when software is the core and tech is the core of what you're building, every year it gets better. It's sort of like improving returns, the investment you put it in and so on. And so um, certainly the stuff that uh, I think has found the most immediate and unanimous support inside Sapphire has been software businesses addressing the real estate vertical. And so just to pimp a portfolio company for a second, side uh, came through. I brought a lot of different prop tech businesses through that were kind of more high on prop, low on tech. <laughs> and there were sort of questions on like, <laughs> is this really a tech business and does this, you know, well, we see the benefits that we know and love from software, and I think uh, Guy and team did an amazing pitch, and just the business really is about uh, technology that empowers the real estate vertical. And so I think for us, it's sort of like finding that common ground um, and finding businesses that we believe have these kind of like long runway, uh, high margin tech business embedded in real estate. One more question, or? Anybody else? Yeah. Hi. So um, I've been seeing very little, uh, I guess, uh, investments or excitement around facilities management. Uh, that being said, you know, there's uh, companies like SMS Assist, uh, that, you know, they're a billion dollar company uh, in the space over the past uh, five years. Uh, CBRE has bought uh, Facility Source, uh, JL bought Corrigo. Uh, and so on. Uh, so what are your thoughts in, in integrated facilities management and like 
the life cycle of, of, of a business in general in terms of uh, in investment basis or, you know, how is that playing out? You know, the sort of questions that one would ask is often around like, what is the sort of, what is the sales cycle within those sort of businesses and what's the margin potential? Um, and so it obviously depends on the type of business, but I think you've, um, you know, that the, you know, the fragmentation can be a benefit to many of these businesses, but it's also going to be very painful. Um, and I think there's someone who is, you know, if it, once you look at the kind of like participants in the, in the sort of ecosystem, sometimes within, within the real estate industry, like some of them don't have obvious incentives to be efficient. Um, and, you know, some of them have incentives to kind of maintain the status quo. Um, so trying to, you know, just like any enterprise sale, it's like if you're selling a sort of IT services into a, you know, if, if you're providing a service that might eliminate the role of a person, it's going to be quite challenging to get that through. So probably just, I think it's probably around sales psychology and, and getting, the, well, getting the model right. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you guys so much, both for this panel and for organizing what is quickly evolving to be my favorite prop tech related event. <laughs> so great. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you.